Open Education Week, uh, the session on how to be more open, advice for educators and researchers. And we've got a wonderful panel of experts here with us today uh, to answer the questions um, that uh, we've posted uh, on the EDEN website. Um, and also to answer some of your questions that you might have about how you can be more open as an educator or researcher. But I'd like to start first by introducing the members of um, our panel today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Chrissy Naranzi. Uh, Chrissy is an academic developer in the Center for Excellence of Learning and Teaching at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. Um, she's a passionate open practitioner and open collaborator uh, who has con conceived and co-founded a range of open cross-institutional and professional development initiatives for academics and other professionals uh, who teach or support learning in higher education. Um, she's got a number of examples of that, such as at OpenFDOL, at TLC webinars, um, and hashtag 101 Open Stories. Uh, maybe Chrissy can share some of those with you uh, in the chat so that you can check those out later. Uh, Chrissy's also an open researcher. Um, and a PhD student and member of GoGN, a key output of her research uh, is the openly licensed cross-boundary collaborative open learning framework she developed. Our next panelist is Catherine Cronin, uh, who is an educator and researcher in the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Um, Catherine's work focuses on openness and open education, digital identity practices, and navigating formal and informal learning. She's currently completing her PhD, exploring the use of open educational practices in higher education, something I would love to see when she's finished. Uh, Catherine advocates a critical approach to openness and is a regular contributor to conversations and collaborative projects in the area of open education within Ireland and globally. For example, co-creator of the Go Open Wiki um, and contributor to the curriculum for digital education Le leadership and the author of Openness and Praxis, Exploring OEP in Higher Education. She blogs at katherinecronin.wordpress.com and um, she can share that with us too in the chat. Um, our next panelist is Lorna Campbell and Lorna works at OER Liaison, Open Scotland within the Learning, Teaching and Web Services Division at the University of Edinburgh. Lorna has worked in EdTech for 20 years and has a long-standing commitment to supporting open education technology policy and practice. She leads the Open Scotland Initiative, co-chaired the OER 16 Open Culture Conference, and is a trustee of Wikimedia UK and the Initiative co um, and the Association for Learning Technology. You could tell I'm reading notes here. So she maintains a number of blogs, including Open World at Lorna, LornaMCampbell.org and Open Scotland at OpenScot.net, and often provides social media coverage for academic conferences and events in the area of open education <laughs> and learning technology. Okay, Our final panelist is Fabio <laughs> Nassim Benny. I guess I'm here to you. Tell Fabio, he had to tell me how to pronounce his name. Hello, everybody. He said, just Again, go thank for you it. very much for um, Fabio works for, as assistant for, professor in the International kind of University of La Rioja and is, is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sao, Sao Paulo, USP, Sao Paulo, where he collaborates with the CEST um, uh, Centro de Estudos Sobre Tecnología e Sociedad. He is a member of the Community. Executive Committee so <clears> of the European Distance and E-Learning Network, EDEN, of the Editorial Board of the I think Rotal Journal, would come up as well as a member of reason. a number of scientific Why communities not? in the field of learning innovation. Um, then I'm He's an active member in the field of innovation in ICT He's for learning since 1998 I mean, okay. by designing and coordinating more than 40 research education, and innovation projects learning. and promoting learning European and like international the collaboration open. in so, different areas, from so school education nobody, projects and promoting um, to higher education and, uh, and lifelong uh, learning. Further, he has coordinated a number of international open uh, development, educational uh, research, uh, specifically focusing on Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia. His main research interests are open education, uh, and learning innovation, e-learning, e digital literacy, social and digital inclusion, and social networking. So, a big thank you uh, to our panelists, and thank you for joining us. And with further ado, I'd like to start out with, with our first question for the webinar today. We'll be um, discussing, uh, we'll be having five different questions and then opening up um, the, so the it questions for people who are diversity. Attending. Our first question to the panelists is, 
Why should I be more open uh, in my practice and profession? To work with what, what, are, what are some of the reasons that you see? Different uh, maybe we could start with Chrissy. But often we talk about, about you know, connecting with like-minded people, but there's actually a lot of value in connecting with other-minded people and open education and open learning. enables exactly that. I mean, my personal research, and I think I'll let somebody else uh, take over uh, and respond, uh, is in the area of academic development, like Lisa said uh, already. Um, but I've developed an open cross cross-boundary collaborative open learning framework, which through the research, it was a phenomenographic study, what came out is that actually what the individuals valued the most is, is that they had the opportunity to work exactly with what I said before, with people who are are different. People who are not just okay, Catherine, would you like to education, people oh. who are not just from another discipline in higher education, who might be students, who might be teachers elsewhere, who might be the wider public and they found that especially extremely refreshing and that uh, boosted um, their confidence A in participation and B in knowledge co-creation. So that would be my quick response and mm. I'll hand over to, to my colleague. Thank you. Catherine, would you sure. like to respond um, to the question? It's Often difficult, I think, when you ask someone who has been an open practitioner for some time, as we are on the panel, and I, I see many of the participants as well, um, to think back to what it felt like to, you know, in those first baby steps of, of going open or becoming open. But certainly, um, whatever I anticipated in the beginning when I began to use open practices has been far out exceeded um, in, in terms of what's actually happened for me as a learner, as an educator, and as a researcher. So I, I was uh, motivated to, to go more open as an educator. I, I just felt that my students and I were networked individuals. We were meeting in higher education and to actually go into bounded spaces, like within the learning management system, to, to learn in, the, in, in a small, isolated community only. Um, failed students at some level, because when they leave higher education, they practice in a culture which is increasingly networked and participatory. So I began to use open pedagogy, open assessment, and so on, and my open practice grew from that. So you know, I would, I would certainly identify myself now as someone who benefits tremendously from my open practices in terms of support, information, friendship um, across the networks that I have. And I know we'll talk more, but I'll keep that just brief for now. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Lorna, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think just to say, I mean, I absolutely agree with Catherine. I think when you have been um, involved in open practice for so long, it becomes it becomes a very natural thing to do, and I think it can be quite difficult to uh, try and remember why you started doing this in the first place and put yourself in the perspective of um, people who this is not a natural way of being. I mean, certainly from, from my perspective, um, I've worked a lot of my career on um, short-term research projects. I've moved from one project to the next very rapidly. Sometimes that's involved moving from one institution to the next as well. And I kind of find that um, it seemed more natural to me not to bind my, um, my work up to a, an academic identity within a single institution. Uh, because my work was always out with colleagues all over the world, particularly when I worked in international standards. You know, it, it was second nature to be working with people all over the world. 
Um, and I think that's really where my open practice grew from. Um, and it also seemed to be quite sensible for me to have a kind of identity for my um, for my for my academic practice that was without out with the institution. Um, and I mean that's certainly the way that I've worked for for many years now. I'm very I'm very lucky to work in a university now that has a lot of support for open education. Um, but to me, my identity as an open practitioner is something that's kind of like um, it's additional to yeah, my identity as my job in my institution. And as Catherine said, you you build up these networks, and to some extent they they become. Your, your professional practice network, but also your, your network of friends and colleagues and, and the people who support you. So I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's quite hard to step back and think, well, you know, why did I get involved with this in the first place? Because it's just such an integral part of um, who I am really now, I guess. Yeah, would you well, like to add something? Well, I tend to, to agree question? with uh, whatever, whatever has been said. My my. What I'm doing lately, I'm talking to a lot of um, not so open professors. Basically, in my research, I'm trying to understand why um, educators uh, refuse to open up a bit. And so, my my normally my my narrative there, and I think the the answer to this question is that uh, by getting open, um, you you gain much more than what you spend. So, in fact, uh, uh, let's say the the effort needed. Uh, to, to do things uh, in a more open way, of course, that can mean many things, but uh, let's say keeping it to a minimum is a very small effort. You're talking about, uh, you know, reasoning or licenses, talking about sharing stuff. That's not a big deal, but the effect you can get uh, the, and the benefit you can get is much broader in terms of uh, not only recognition, but also, you know, um, professional networks and stuff like that. So basically what I'm trying to explain to people all the time is that uh, Getting open has nothing to do with, you know, changing completely your life. It is true that it then becomes a way of thinking and a way of, uh, you know, approaching your, your your job and your life. But at the very beginning, for people who have never thought of uh, really getting open, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to, to to tell them is that you just, you can do this step by step with small steps, uh, which is not uh, expensive, which is not uh, time consuming and so on. And in a few cases, this works, and I get feedback from people like, uh, you know, you know, I was tweeting uh, on my work, and people are appreciating that. I would never have thought about it. No, people are replying to me. And this is, uh, you know, if you've never done it, you don't think this could happen. It's obvious. So I think it's a matter of uh, convincing the convincible uh, professionals, uh, which is not 100%, uh, unfortunately, but I think the, 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 the reason is clear and the, what should be made clear is the, the trade-off. I mean, that the, it is not a very difficult and expensive thing in terms of time to be done, but the reward can be really big. Yes, I think um, Lauren has made a really good point here about small steps toward openness. And, and I'd like to move on to the next question, um, asking you how you practice openness. Um, not all of you are teachers, um, perhaps from your perspective as researchers. How do you practice uh, openness in everyday life? And uh, let's start with Lorna this time. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I think there's lots of ways. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is just very, very small things that mean you, you practice what you preach. Um, so, for example, I know that um, open education, the open education space covers um, a very wide area. A lot of my practice is actually focused around open education resources. So one of the things I always try to do is um, whenever I'm writing blog posts, whenever I'm giving presentations, is make sure everything's properly licensed. <laughs> Make sure I've got a Creative Commons license on everything I publish. Make sure all my images are properly cited. And I think it's it's very easy to overlook things like that. But I think it, I think it's quite important if you if you are advocating for open practice that you're seen to really practice what you preach because you can't really sort of um, encourage and advise other people to do things if they don't see you doing them themselves. Um, also, I think um, just keeping communication channels open is very important. Um, I make a lot of use um, of Twitter. Um, I 
you know, whenever I'm participating in events, I use a hashtag. It's just become again second nature for me if I'm um, attending events to tweet. And the reason I do that, I think, is is really to engage other people to make sure that other people who aren't able to attend an event in person um, can still have some of that experience. And I think it comes back to a conversation that we were having um, actually before we went live um, about the whole issue of access and equality and inclusivity. And I certainly see that that's a really important affordance for um, uh, openness. And so certainly, you know, just tweeting from a conference using a hashtag is a very, very simple thing to do. But for people who can't be there in person, that's their route in, that's their channel in. So, so these are just a, a couple of the things that I do to try and sort of practice openness. Sure, yeah, I, I like think that's beautifully expressed, Lorna, and, and that's just that whole idea about um, that it's embedded in, in all your practice. And um, you know, as your open practice grows, uh, you, those different things become connected. So if you, you know, if you do a presentation, you might blog about it and then share it on Twitter, and you know, th those are all kind of mutually reinforcing. And um, just, I think, um, just uh, in terms of um, as an educator as well, um, that power of modeling is, is so important. I mean, I felt that uh, although when I was when I was teaching undergraduates and using open practices with them, open tools and blogging and Twitter and open conversations and so on, many of the students chose not to be individually open, and I didn't require that. My philosophy was that um, I'm an open practitioner and model that. Our course is a node in the network. Or so our course is open, and then every individual student in that course could make their own choice about how open, open they wanted to be. So, you know, in that setup, modeling is um, is incredibly powerful. So, just presenting myself as a learner, as much as a teacher, you know, when we have open conversations, you know, asking questions of the people who we invite in, which might be the people whose papers or blog posts we're reading. So um, just just picking up on what Lorna said there, that modeling I think is just so so powerful, and recognizing that um, through our open practice, people will see us um, and learn, possibly, um, and but ultimately make their own choices about how open they wish to be. Yes, I mean, um, very Great, rich discussion you. already. Uh, I totally agree with here? Catherine, Lorna, and Fabio what has been said about mod the importance of modeling, but also the importance of doing a baby step, um, sort of, and not reinventing the wheel. There's a lot that we do already that we can perhaps open up. Um, what I would like to, to add is also, if we want our practice to become open, uh, sort of student-facing um, work, learning and teaching to become open, it's also important to invest in open uh, academic development, sort of help uh, academics to, to immerse themselves as learners, to experience what that actually means, and then get ideas for their own practice. Thank you. Okay. Fabio, last but not least. <laughs> On strange resistances, but at the end of the day, we were able, and we might be launching this pretty soon, to to convince the the, the leadership of the university to endorse uh, an open education strategy for the university. This is probably the first uh, one of the first uh, private universities uh, strategy in this sense. And this, I'm telling this because, I mean. One thing is uh, to practice openness uh, um, on, on one's own, so in a sort of um, half-hidden way, let's say, when, I'm, when I'm, you know, I'm using my PowerPoints and I also share them on SlideShare, nobody will notice that, that's fine, I'm doing it, you know, I'm doing it for the sake of, uh, of being open and that's it. But this is me and a couple of guys at the university and that's, and that's all. The other level is to try to convince the system or to try to, to, to change a bit the institution and that is the, the, the most difficult uh, step, but of course also, is also the most important one because then things will become uh, sustainable. And so I, I would say I have two, two levels myself. One level is what I do sometimes in a kind of a guerrilla way, so I just share stuff there and you know, nobody, nobody either notice or care. And on the other side, and I think the people in the, the other, my, my, my fellow speakers have the same, some of you have this experience, 
to try to convince policy, more po policy, let's say, at institutional level, but also at uh, sometimes governmental level, that things should change. And this is a, um, is a different but pretty important, I would say, way to practice open also. Okay, now we come to a question that I think is probably on the minds of many of uh, the researchers here um, and probably those that are pursuing their PhDs. And that's the question of how do we deal with publish or perish? Uh, it's a reality within academia and um, what do you do? Where do you start? How do you, um, how do you put your stuff out there to make it open when your um, institution requires uh, that um, you know you publish and maybe the open um, journals aren't where you want to publish or where you're being asked to publish uh, how do you handle that situation yes well this is a, to me Fabio. is a very difficult maybe question if you time. if you if you want my honest opinion is that this is um, I mean as as long as uh, researchers do not make a serious move to change the thing uh, and the, the, the status quo this uh, publish or perish uh, reality, as you rightly point, uh, will not change. So it's um, it's a blind alley, blind alley, you say in English. No, it's something that is uh, is like that, uh, and uh, it is a, a reality that has been uh, created by academics themselves. So it's even more complicated to to change it. What I can say in uh, what I'm trying to 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 practice myself is to. Um, let's say, to pre-publish a number of things, uh, or to pre-publish uh, or also post-publish sometimes pieces of, uh, of, uh, of my research that sometimes uh, for, uh, again, for because of the system, I, I, I'm sort of forced to publish in journals which are not fully open. Let's say, to try to, 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 to take out uh, pieces of my work, uh, to, to restructure them a bit and to publish them in blogs and stuff like that, so that you have a uh, two, two ways, you know, the official way, which unfortunately is not always open, and the unofficial way, or let's say the, the most, uh, the more underground way, where you can uh, publish, and especially, and this is uh, clearly telling us that open would be much better, this is the way where you get feedback, where you get comment, where you get uh, your work enriched. Typically, when you publish on a big, closed journal, well, I, I, I don't know what, what's your opinion. I would like to hear the opinion of my colleagues, but I, I never got any feedback. I mean, if I publish, if I publish on a proper blog or on a, on a lively blog, uh, I get much more feedback and therefore my work is rich, is, gets, uh, gets improved. So it would, my, my suggestion there, I do ideally, is by, by also publishing in uh, non-official or in, uh, let's say, semi-academic semi uh, or practitioners, uh, true practitioners uh, vehicles, let's say. Yes, thanks very yeah, much. Um, uh, uh, Pre-publication, I think, is a, is a terrific way um, to get around that, in a way. Um, just in terms of context, I think it's uh, useful and kind of empowering to think that we are living through a time of culture change in higher education. So there will be resistance. That's just part of what's happening. And trying to find the, the soft spaces where we might be able to make progress is part of um, is part of driving change. And one of those ways is to work closely with library staff, because I think in many cases, even where universities don't have open education policies or position statements yet, um, libraries more and more are having open access policies and that you will often find people in the library who will help you um, figure out how and when you can publish depending on what the journal is and I've, I've recently had some experience with this and and then apart from that Lisa you mentioned you know academia.edu and researchgate and and other um, kind of open access repositories but you know if you can use your institutional repository um, and really kind of drive that, that can also be a great way of modeling that for your colleagues as well. So um, I really think every, every point that we push around this, you know, every paper that we get into an open repository, every time we do this, every time we blog about it, we are part of that culture change. You know, so we who are the open practitioners, you know, 
are, are helping to facilitate that change. So it might feel like just an individual act, an individual blog post or paper, but in this particular time of change, you know, all of those together um, are very powerful. So we're once again back to modeling behavior in order to affect change. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, Lauren, again, would you I like to add on? I agree with everything Catherine said. I think um, you know we are in a time of change, and I think we need to keep pushing forward in terms of um, open access for um, funded scholarly works. And um, I think I think the the open access movement has made you know really important strides forward. And um, I would absolutely agree for you know publishing academics. You know, make the most of your library and your librarians because you know that they, they can help you in this area they can advise on open access publication um from my own perspective i think it's also important to you know do what fabio said and you know try and work around the edges um academic publishing is a bit of a racket to be perfectly honest but i think you know you know we do what we can to try and subvert that in little ways and whether that is you know pre-publication or publishing blog posts or publishing different versions or making things available um, through other channels. I, I, I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think it's it's interesting that we're starting to hear more about um, copyright reform, about open peer review, um, about different ways of working that I hope will, you know, eventually start to challenge the, you know, the power of the academic publishers. So um, I think it is really important that we do keep um, trying to find ways to change practice while at the same time i think you know i do recognize that you know there is enormous pressure on research academics to publish through um particular routes and i think maybe as open practitioners we need to try and sort of like as, as catherine said you know lead the way and try to show how we can sort of Very good Something point. I just uh, read Debbie's uh, comment like here. I find that all really question? complicated, the publishing. And um, I mean, maybe that sums up what research, how many people feel about research more generally. Um, what I would like to add, perhaps, to the conversation is what, based on on what Fabio said about getting feedback, publishing, sharing, you know, uh, more um, half baked, uh, perhaps, uh, research or scholarly activity through blog posts or other online um, means. Uh, and getting that feedback because I mean ideas can only grow and evolve I think if they are shared so I think we do need to be brave and get them out there and through that conversation through the dialogue and through the academic debate we are going to have a we will grow personally but also the knowledge base will grow and we will connect with loads of uh, exciting uh, ideas and, and colleagues around the world but also I think uh, and then I'll, I'll stop here it's, it's about uh, also developing um, different perhaps kind of opportunities for academic development. As an academic developer, I look at ways of how we can engage academics in enhancing their teaching practice. And while academics will be actively involved in disciplinary research, and we talk about open access research in that area, there's also an opportunity to engage them in uh, academic CPDs through a more scholarly uh, way of looking at their teaching practice. And, that, and doing that in an open um, space and, and forum. So there's a lot of value in that because we often complain that we don't get the academics, we don't get everybody involved in academic CPD. So could this be something that should be considered further? Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, you've all talked about how to be more open, uh, both through your example um, as practitioners of openness and also um, in some of your advice about being open. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit more about what kind of platforms you use or environments you use uh, that support you in being more open as an academic. Um, there's been mention of ResearchGate as an example. Um, there was an example posted by, by Graham who talked about uh, Wikipedia preprint in order to provide research early. What, what, what platforms do you personally use um, to, uh, to, to really demonstrate your openness? 
<clears throat> well, you always start the difficult questions with me. Uh, I would say, I would say, um, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm thinking mostly of what I mostly use are uh, specific, uh, um, are not, let's say, um, environments uh, which are uh, thought uh, for publishing. Yeah. Um, for publishing scientific research. To make an example, when I'm talking about uh, practitioners, uh, practitioners uh, platforms, I'm thinking of the Open Education Europa platform, which uh, now it, uh, well, it's a bit changed and it's going through a renewal, which in my, in my opinion is not that good, but the way it was, it was pretty useful because you could really get comments on your research by uh, practitioners, by teachers, by by people on the on the ground, and this is uh, and then of course you can use this uh, this feedback in your research. So it's uh, it's enriching also from that point of view. Of course, ResearchGate is useful, especially when you when you, when it's about publishing data. I mean, this is also something which is not uh, which is not uh, of minor importance. Uh, I mean, everyone, most of us have uh, some uh, some data to be to be to be published, and publishing that open is also openly is also is also quite important and on ResearchGate or Academia you can you have a specific place to publish your data which is also which is also good even if uh, I have a I, I mean all this open data uh, thing my my I have a concern on the fact that I have never heard of somebody using data from others I mean typically researchers love to use their own data for their own research so there, there is another barrier, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, use if, if, if I'm using data by somebody mm -hmm. else, then uh, I perceive that my research is, uh, is less valuable, which is totally not true. But this is something which I also feel myself. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I understand, the, I understand the issue. But uh, nevertheless, I think sharing data is also important. And this is, uh, I think it wasn't like that at the beginning, but now, uh, for example, ResearchGate is giving us the possibility to do that. But mostly, my 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 advice would be to go for the practitioners journal. In this in the states, you have this. Uh, I think it's called Teachers 2.0. It's a massive uh, online community. I mean, like thousands of teachers, uh, super active. It's impressive the how much they are how much they are they are working and collaborating. Or another idea, another platform I'm, I've been using quite a lot is the wikieducator.org, which you might know. That is very good, I think, to be to be seen. And I think I got 2,000, when I put there my research project, I got like 2,000 views in the first uh, couple of days. So it's really, it's a really good reach, especially from, uh, again, from the English speaking world. But okay, this is uh, our world. So we need to, we need to cope with that. Not so much in in terms of feedback. I didn't get a lot of feedback. I got some, but it's mostly I think to be to be read and to be to be viewed. The good thing is that being a wiki, you can keep up with your research. And again, every time you you update your stuff, uh, you if you are if you are brave enough, you should let everybody know so that then you get a bit into the into a into a virtual uh, virtual circle of commenting and at least of showing that uh, that your research is alive and, and going forward. Did I answer your question? Please. Hmm. Yes, you did. Thank you, Fabio. Yeah, not too much. Uh, Lorna would like to add to the, the question uh, itself, to... but. Um, a point that Fabio made about um, open data and the reuse of open data. I think open data is an increasingly important mm -hmm. part of the open education environment. And I think it's something that we all need to be more aware of and pay more, more attention to. Um, a couple of resources I'd like to highlight. One is a really excellent resource, um, a report written by our colleagues, um, Javier Asmas mm -hmm. and Leela Haberman for the Open Knowledge Open Education uh, Working Group about open data as OER. And when I mm -hmm. stop speaking, I'll put the link in the in the chat. That's a really, really useful resource. It presents case studies of how you can use open data as OER. Another really useful tool for sharing open oh. data is Wikidata, which is really starting to take off. So again, I would really encourage um, people to have a look at Wikidata. And I think we might have some case mm -hmm. studies from the University of Edinburgh from our um, or Wikimedia in residence here about how you can use Wikidata both mm -hmm. for your research and your teaching. But the other thing I wanted to mention is a project that I'm involved in 
in the University of Edinburgh at the moment, which is actually to develop um, an online course um, to highlight um, to the general public, not so not just academic researchers, but actually the general public, people who are out with mm -hmm. the academic domain, that universities produce all this stuff that is free and openly licensed and that they can use it and here is how you find it. So it's going to cover everything from open access um, scholarly works to open data to open archives and collections and it's going to be a very short um, course running on FutureLearn which will be aimed at the general public, entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises. But we all know that MOOCs are questionable in their openness, shall we say. Um, so we're also going to make all the materials we, we produce um, openly licensed CC BY and they'll be available from the, the Open.ed website as well, hopefully. Um, so that's just something we're trying to do to, to help address this, this problem is, um, you know, we produce all this open stuff, but are other people using it, particularly in terms of open access research and open data? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to throw that in there um, in terms of that. Sure, I'm so glad Fabio and Lorna are here. That is just <laughs> like two of the best people who could uh, who could um, discuss that aspect of, of open data. So thank you. Um, when you first asked the question, Lisa, uh, my um, I, I was thinking of something else of just maybe people who aren't involved in um, in research or to the point of dealing with open data, but just wondering, you know, how do I even how do I even engage with openness? How do I take those first baby steps, as we called them? And one of the questions that I find really useful, whether working with students, uh, lecturers, librarians, support staff, you know, wherever people may be, is just what conversations do you want to be a part of? And you know, depending on who you are and your context, the answer to that may be different. So, what conversations are happening that you would like to be a part of? So, you know, perhaps it's people whose work you are studying, um, people on campus who you see who you really admire, people in the public who who are who are doing work that you would like to do. So just see where they are openly online. Um, what tools are they using? What are their networks? And you know, it can start really, really gently like that. And then if there are some open practitioners in your immediate area, um, again, have a chat with them, have a cup of coffee with them. And you know, I've helped many people kind of get started with open practice. And you know, m my advice is just really mostly to have fun with it. So it's not another project or another task. So for example, if you start using Twitter, um, I would say, you know, create your account on Twitter and then on a Friday evening sit with a glass of wine when you're relaxing and just put it on your phone and have a look at it and look at who you know, see who they're following, build your network slowly and um, really enjoy it um, because that's, um, that's what it's all about as well. That's it. I guess I can add a little something if that's okay. I mean, Fabio started um, talking about uh, getting feedback um, on our work through publishing it openly, maybe as a blog post, etc. But this does happen automatically. And Catherine already uh, indicated the importance of having conversations and the importance of giving and engaging. So I think that's really important to highlight because often there, there might be an expectation, oh, I've put something online, everybody's going to read it and Millions of people are going to respond. It's not going to happen. You need to develop these networks, these uh, contacts, these connections with, with people and their ideas. And also reach out um, and connect with other people's ideas. Because it's not so much about ourselves. I think it's more about others and how we can connect to them. So keeping that in mind and trying to, to, to take the risk. For some people, it might be something completely new and alien. but. Um, we need to, to, to make that first step. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to. Um, okay, uh, Lorna, you wanted to, to add the original something. question, and to you know again agree with everything that, that Chrissy and Catherine have said is about you know platforms and environments and tools to use for openness. And I think one of the really important things to communicate um, to colleagues who are perhaps maybe a bit unsure about openness is just to encourage them to use it, tools that they're familiar with. You don't need um, special platforms or special kit. You don't need expensive software to become open. You, you can use a lot of the tools that are just there. 
Um, and that's, um, I mean, that's something I very much do myself. I mean, the main tools I use are WordPress and Twitter, um, SlideShare, uh, Storify. Um, you know, these are the tools that I use every day as an open practitioner. But you, you can also scale that up as well. And I think um, within the University of Edinburgh, um, where we do provide a lot of support for openness, but we still base that around um, uh, a wide range of tools, some of which are institutionally supported um, systems, um, like uh, Media Hopper, which is our, our main um, multimedia management platform. And that's, that's a large um, investment, that centrally supported software. Um, but Open.ed, the, um, uh, the site for open educational resources, that, that's just a WordPress blog. And it pulls in content from Flickr and from YouTube and from SlideShare. And I think, you know, there's a lot you can do that's quite simple and that uses tools that are already out there um, to, and you can use those tools to further your open practice. And I think what you'll find is that there are already people there. There are already communi communities of open practitioners there. Um, and it's just about connecting people up with these communities. Thank you. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I find um, as an uh, educator um, getting my students to use the social media to get out there to connect with people has been hugely beneficial to them and to their learning process. So um, well those are all the questions that I had and I'd like to know if members of um, the audience, members of uh, our participants today would have any additional questions that they would like to ask the panel. Go ahead and enter them in the chat box and they'll be happy to respond. Uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to add while people are thinking about their questions? We told you that we would have difficulty being quiet, didn't we? <laughs> okay, we got Catherine and we've got Lorna. Um, <laughs> sorry. Fine. Um, a, a thought that just listening to Lorna there that I was thinking was, you know, um, in, in just becoming open and kind of embarking on open practice, I think, yes, use the tools that you know and be gentle and, and have fun. But I remember the spark for me was, um, it, particularly with blogging, was um, I was using a lot of open resources I was using in my teaching and in my learning. And I realized that, you know, there was this notion of the commons, that the reason that there was all this great stuff out there for me to use and to share with my students was because other people individually were sharing their work you know, using the Creative Commons and, and just sharing without any knowledge of, um, of who might pick it up and how. And that was, that was when the penny dropped for me. And I thought, you know, if I am partaking of all this, you know, knowledge and resources and networks that are there, then, you know, I need to give back and to share as well. And then I think that is really the whole ethos in, in openness. And I'm, I'm sure all, all of us here would agree. And, um, and once you start, it only grows, as Fabio said. But I think, you know, just that germ of an idea was really what changed everything for me. Yeah, I just wanted to um, actually um, respond to a point you made yourself, Lisa, about the, 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 the challenge of engaging students um, with social media for their, their learning and encouraging students to become um, more open learners. Um, one of the initiatives that, that we ran at Edinburgh um, is 23 Things, which if you look in the chat there, you'll see my colleague, um, Charlie Farley, um, who ran this um, short online course, which is basically designed to engage people with um, social media. Charlie will be able to tell you where the course originally came from. I don't know who developed it, but we adapted it for use in Edinburgh and it's a lot of fun. Um, and it basically just introduces you to a different um, social media tool um, every week. I did it myself, despite the fact that, you know, I've, I've been using social media for years and it's just, you know, it's, it's second nature to me, but I had a lot of fun doing it. And I actually learned a lot and it made me stop and think and reflect about how I use social media or don't use social media. Um, so again, that's an open resource um, and all of all the things that we produce for that course are openly licensed. Okay, um, I mean, if somebody would start or has an interest or okay. uh, to, to become uh, open, uh, to, to become an open practitioner, 
I mean, I see it as a continuum, uh, I would say, and perhaps where to start would be to listen and watch, to be there, but maybe a fly on the on the wall, I think there's an English expression. <laughs> um, I, I would say the next stepping stone might be to join and, you know, take the risk, if you like, uh, and be, um, be there and participate, uh, establish a voice. And the next one, uh, the next step uh, from that would be go for it. Uh, do something uh, innovative, creative, um, with others, because you are not on your own uh, in the open. You have loads of allies that you are not aware of. They are out there waiting for you, but you need to make the first step, so go for it. Um, so there's a space out there, there's all these people and ideas that are floating around online, but also offline. I think what we haven't perhaps mentioned is the offline dimension of open learning, the local dimension, how we can actually connect with people locally in our communities. Um, so there are loads of opportunities and if we take these stepping stones, um, it, it can lead to some great discoveries, I think, and, and surprises. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a comment. I have a comment that is uh, sort of, of also maybe responding to the question which was put there. In fact, uh, my my it's, uh, it's a consideration which is a bit transversal to to all the questions which I forgot to, to tell before. I think the one of the keys in my understanding to to both to convince people to to build capacity of of educators especially and to keep them being open because it's also important. You know, once maybe you, you give it a try and then you go back to your normal life. Um, I think is to focus uh, uh, on all aspects uh, of openness, uh, of all activities related to openness. Uh, I mean, typically we, one thinks of openness uh, and you think of, uh, you know, open licensing and OER and reusing, which is very good, it is very important and so on. But then you have, you know, of course, uh, open pedagogy, which as was mentioned there is pretty important and opens up, a, you know, a whole world of possibilities and a whole world of debates. But then you have open, open evaluation and, of course, uh, the open badges, which was mentioned uh, many times in a single uh, chat uh, line uh, uh, before uh, by Debbie, is, uh, is also, uh, I mean, something which could change the system, sort of, and open design. So at least uh, what I'm looking at in my research are these four uh, aspects, design, content, pedagogy, and, uh, and evaluation. And, and, and on the relation among themselves uh, and on how uh, openness can be approached uh, or should be approached from different perspectives. So when you are, if, you know, if I have to convince, uh, <clears throat> when I have to convince uh, uh, an educator or a decision maker on going for openness, on going for it, as we said in the chat, I try to find the weak point, uh, so the, 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 the area where he or she is more open already, because of course if somebody doesn't like to share his own content, but likes to talk very much. I mean, I'm Italian, so you might understand that we, that's what we do all the time. So I like to collaborate and to talk and to network. Okay, that's enough. You know, you start with that and you discover that then the next step is sharing your content. Because once you are, you know, once the trust level has increased, then you will be sharing and, and licensing openly your content. So my, my point of advice there is uh, um, to try to... Um, to try to keep in mind different entry points onto openness and to try to use them uh, depending on whom we are trying to work with or to, or to convince, let's say. Very good point, uh, Fabio. Um, we've got a question from the audience, and that question is, just a second, I need to scroll down. There's been so many comments in the chat box. Is there any focus in the general open approach to considerations of accessibility of open content data, pedagogy, and strategies? Um, is there anyone from the panel that would like to speak to accessibility? I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, I, I think all, all I was just going to say very briefly was I think a lot of um, 
in terms of accessibility, a lot of the, the good practice that's required for um, openness um, should also um, aid accessibility. And I think it's important to, um, to bear that in mind that um, there's, there's good practice for good practice for making your resources and your data open should also help with them ensuring that they're accessible as well. I think sometimes maybe you need to go a little bit further than that, but certainly. Yes, I want to say something <laughs> along the same lines, uh, Lorna. Definitely good practice is inclusive practice, and that means having a variety of approaches um, uh, in the design, embedded in the curriculum design. So if, if we are concerned about the quality of, um, of, of the open design, of open education in general, I think we just need to, to get back to what actually um, good practice means. And the principles of that also apply across the open practice. And variety is key. I mean, in my uh, recent research, what I found is I had actually one participant in the study who was dyslexic. And um, she obviously struggled, uh, this person struggled with the text. But there were videos, there were a variety of audios, and all kinds of different approaches to engage fully. And that variety was highlighted as, as inclusive in that uh, circumstance. But there will be different things working for different people. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a, a, a overarching question, so I'm not really Catherine, sure. I mean, like I, I'd like to address the open pedagogy piece, but um, yeah, perhaps the um, question could be clarified if, if I'm going off track here. But basically, um, you know, there is an awful lot of work and growing body of work around open pedagogy and open educational practices, and I'll put a couple of references in there, but it was one of the aspects of that question. So. Um, you know, if you want to clarify the question, the person who asked that, please do keep the conversation going and I'll put in some links there. But um, there's some wonderful work and wonderful people to follow um, in the area of open pedagogy and always. Well, everything has been said. I, 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 I more or less, I think here, if the question is, is there any focus uh, on, on all these things? I think the focus uh, most of the times is not there. What I, oh, yeah. what I find most of the times is that uh, open experiences are really connected to, to one person or to one group within an institution. So I think whenever we speak about, uh, you know, open content, open pedagogy, and even open strategy, the, the, the big challenge there still is to sort of uh, mainstream or institutionalize it. So I, I know that uh, some of us here have been doing some, uh, trying to do something in this respect. So I don't know if I got the question right, but to me the focus should really be on moving from the experimentation to the to the system uh, system um, level. Let's say. A popular question. <laughs> Is that allowed? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Papi, you said. Are there any more questions that uh, um, anyone would like to Open education. Ask. That almost sounds painful um, to me, I have to say, as a, as, a, as a term. But I do understand okay. what, what you're trying to say. I'm just interested in how sure. can we make that happen. If you are an individual, uh, an open practitioner in an institution, and there is no buy-in at the moment, how, how, how can we make that change spread and actually institutionalize it or normalize it perhaps? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think it depends a lot on the institution or on the on the on the moment in the history of an institution or of a country. Let's say I can I can bring you two two short examples. The first, I was mentioning before, the our strategy for open education within uh, UNIR, and there, as I was writing before, the, the the two lucky coincidences were first the existence of a UNESCO chair and an ICD chair, which pushed a lot on this. And of course, when you have big institutions like that you tend to abide, sort of. And at the same time, what we did was really to engage everybody in the leadership of the university. Everybody, I mean that we had like 50 contributors to this document, out of which I think 45 did not know what it was about, but they contributed anyway, because of course they want to write something in such an important document. And as soon as they have contributed, even with two lines, then they cannot say this, they cannot say anything against it. So that was a bit the trick, but a very basic one, but uh, it worked. 
And in terms of, of more, um, let's say, another example is what is happening. I wanted to, to, to quote this, what is happening in Morocco and uh, where we, that is an issue of a normalization, let's say, even at a broader level, uh, we are, uh, we've been working through the open med project by, um, in order to, to launch soon, well, to prepare and to launch soon <coughs> uh, the open education Morocco declaration, which is uh, taking a lot of, uh, a lot of inspiration from the Open Scotland Declaration by, by Lorne. And uh, there, also there, I think the lucky circumstance was uh, that in this specific moment, uh, the, um, the country is uh, in search for some leadership in the region. So in that case, you know, you, you propose to them something where they can lead and that worked. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of finding the, the good hook, the good way, in, depending on the different moment or the, or the different institution or, uh, or country in this case. I don't think there is a recipe for that. And I agree with you, it can, can be very difficult and very frustrating, especially because in many, as in many past cases, I remember the South Africa, the UNISA, for example, uh, case, uh, you know, things were fantastic for the first year and then uh, they, they slowed down dramatically. <clears throat> and, and if you ask people there, nobody knows why. So it sometimes is also a matter of, you know, uh, ups and downs and moments in an institution. So it's, it's a difficult exercise, absolutely, but, but worth, I think. Okay. Are there any final comments? Could I give you each perhaps one minute to say something that you think is very important for academics and researchers in response to oh, um, this webinar? My what would what be, do they need to do? Just do? Maybe we start with, with Lorna. Speak, speak. My suggestion would be to have a wide open mind. Well, my advice <clears throat> would be a larger networks. In fact, uh, what, what I'm discovering more and more is that people feel very at ease in, within small networks with people uh, in the other room or on the, in the other continent, the people they know very well. But then uh, uh, the, the, the next step is to really get uh, open, so to, to basically uh, enlarge uh, a larger network. And it's a matter of uh, confidence, as Lorna said. So my, my advice would be a larger networks. Uh, I think it's been well said already here, but in the spirit of openness, I would just say that uh, anybody who's here in the webinar, um, I think okay. all of us on the panel and you, Lisa, would be willing to continue the conversation and you can find us very openly online everywhere. So, um, you know, the conversation doesn't end here. Let's continue it and uh, more than happy to do that. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say here uh, also is that these are some wonderful people to follow. So if you're not following them on Twitter or other social media networks, be sure to get out there and do that um, because they model the kind of open behavior that we want to see within academia. So please do get out there. Um, thank you to the, to the panelists for participating today and for those of you in the chat and, and uh, everyone for all of your insights and your comments, not just from the panel, but also from the participants extremely helpful, lots of resources available. Um, I think some of the key takeaways that we, could, that, that we have from this, this webinar today is really, um, you know, there's different levels of openness, there's different levels of how we approach openness, um, and that it's really about connections, connections with other researchers, with other academics, connections with our students, students with other, um, with other students, students with, with researchers. So it's really about building those networks um, and opening up those networks uh, to new ideas and new approaches. Um, so as, as I said, thank you everyone for coming today. I would like to remind you um, tonight there will be an Eden chat um, on MOOCs and soft skills development in higher education. Um, that will be at uh, 8 o'clock, uh, 20 o'clock 20 CEST. Antonella, 
And Fabio will be um, providing uh, the moderation for that discussion, so please be sure to join us there. Um, and also, if you did not register for the webinar and you would like to get a copy of the recording, um, you can sign up. I think we're going to provide that link. Let me just copy that really quick into the, um, into the chat area. And then uh, we will send you um, a copy of the recording um, and uh, an open Thank badge you. as a result. If you could, Christina, could you maybe copy that for me? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Can, again, Bye. thank you to all the panelists. It was Bye. a wonderful discussion, and I really enjoyed meeting with all of you today.